Okay, I'm sorry, that last video I got cut off. He was David, everything else was washed away, the camp, its smell, its touch, and now he was David, his own master, free, free as long as he could remain so. David took a look around. It would not do to go on sitting where he was. A little higher up on the hill, he caught sight of a house among the trees, and a little farther down lay the road. There would soon be people about, and he must find a safe hiding place. He followed the stream a little way, then turned off and went down toward the coast. The going was steep, but David's tough-skinned feet were used to finding places where he could get a good foothold. His body was lithe and quick, and he found no difficulty in keeping his balance. Just before he came to the road, he stopped irresolutely. irresolutely. He could hide in the undergrowth down there, but that meant he would have to lie flat all day. And when he was not sleeping, it would be very irksome to lie in roughly the same position all the time. Now that he was close to the road, he could see that there were houses at regular intervals along both sides of it. Not right on it, but a little above or below with gates leading into it. Beautiful houses, pink and pale yellow and white with gaily painted doors and green trees and climbing plants growing on their walls. But for that very reason, they spelled danger. Where there were houses, there were people. A little farther on, the ground fell away so steeply from the road that there were no houses for some distance. It looked as if he would have to cross over. His heart began to beat quickly. The road wound among the hills and you could not see much of it at a time because it kept bending sharply around the spurs. Even if he were certain the road was clear at the moment, someone might come along just as he began to cross. Not cars nor people walking on the hard surface for David's hearing was good. But if anyone was walking on the grass verge, he would not be able to hear him, hear him until he was right on top of him. Was it all to last only a single morning, his beautiful surroundings, his desire to live? Was it all to be taken away from him again by a single stranger coming along now or in a half an hour's time? But if he stayed where he was, his danger would be just as great. Among the trees, something was growing low on the ground in long rows. It must have been planted there to grow in such straight lines and someone might come along to tend it. Something brightly colored, not yellow nor red, but orange, caught his eye in the grass. It was round and rather soft. David picked it up without thinking and walked the last few yards to the road. The morning was still young and everywhere it was quiet in the sunlight. There was no one to be seen. There was only the stranger David knew might be coming along just around the nearest part of the rock. Um, I don't know what it was he picked up. He didn't make that clear. He crossed the road, not slowly nor hurriedly. Afterward, when his heart had stopped beating so fast, he realized that his decision had changed everything. Ever since the night he had found the bundle lying under the tree, as the man had told him it would be, his feet had carried him along, deciding the way for him. This time, it was he who had made the decision. His feet had not wanted to take the risk of crossing the road, and he had mastered them and forced them to do it. The thought gave David a warm feeling of strength and freedom. From now on, he would think for himself and make his own decisions, and his feet and hands and body would be servants to do his bidding. Down right by the edge of the water, he would be sheltered from the road and the nearest house was a way off. David did not think anyone would be able to see him from there, but he was not sure, and it was necessary to be sure. Over on the next headland, he could see a kind of cave. If he could get over there, he would be safe for the day. But there was a narrow ravine between him and the cave, and it was too far for him to jump across. David put his bundle down and stretched his leg over the edge, feeling about with his foot for some support, but it was very steep and slippery. Only a yard separated him from the best hiding place he had ever seen. I will get over, he said to himself. It must be possible. There must be some way. Perhaps he could find a big stone and drop it into the cleft so that he could clamber across, clamber across. But struggle as he would, he could not budge the only boulder that looked big enough. He would not give in, however, until he finally realized that he could not move it and was only wasting his strength to no purpose. If he had a rope, but there was nothing he could make it fast onto the other side. And the only thing he had that at all resembled a rope was the bit of string around his trousers. Then something brown caught his eye a little farther down on the side of the ravine, a wooden packing case, or rather a plank from one. David suppressed his excitement. It was not big enough, he told himself. Of course, it would not be big enough, but he ought to try just to make sure. When his heart was beating normally again, he set off after it. The plank was long enough. He could lay across it like a bridge and he could pull it after he could cross over so that no one could follow him. But was it stout enough? He found two small stones and laid them one under each other on the plank. Then he stepped carefully onto it. It creaked a little, but it would take his weight. It was very bare on the other side, bare but safe, and there was room enough to lie down. Because of the rock projecting above the shallow cave, he would be in a shadow most of the time. He could see a short stretch of the road above without being seen himself, and he could see the whole coastline toward the east. David took his wet trousers off and spread them in his shirt out to dry in the sun. Then he unpacked his bundle and arranged his possessions neatly by his side, his compass, his knife, his bottle, the chunk of bread the man on board the ship had given him, and finally the round thing he had found. He held it firmly but carefully while he scratched it with his fingernail and bored his finger right through the skin. It was moist inside. Now we're going to find out what it was. He sniffed his finger and licked it. It smelled good and had a bitter sweet taste. 
So he took the skin right off and pulled the inside apart. It was quite easy to separate into small pieces, each like a half moon. He was hungry and he had a bit of bread as well. He wondered if that round thing were fit to eat. Taking a bite, he chewed and swallowed and waited to see what would happen, but nothing happened, nothing except that it tasted good. It did not make him ill. David ate half the pieces and chewed a bit more bread. Then he tried the orange colored peel, but that tasted sharp and unpleasant. He tried to push the thought away, but it kept returning. I don't know anything. How can I stay free when I don't know what everybody else knows? I don't even know what's good to eat and what's poisonous. The only food I know about is porridge and bread and soup. For the moment, he lost courage and fell cast down, felt quite cast down. Why had he not talked to the others in the camp, listened to their conversations and asked about the world outside? Not about food, of course, for there was a rule in the camp that no one might talk about food. For once, it was not one of their rules, but one made by the prisoners themselves. When you had nothing but bread and porridge and not enough of those, you did not want to talk about the kind of food you used to have when you were free. But there were other things he could have talked about. As long as Johannes had been with him, he had asked questions all the time. But he was only a little boy then and had asked all about all sorts of things he had no use for now. He looked out over the blue sea and down along the coast full of bright color and sunshine and clenched his teeth. He would. It was no use sitting there thinking of all the things he ought to have done differently when he was in the camp. That could not be altered now. He must think about Johannes and try to recall all they had talked about. He must remember too what he had heard the other prisoners say before they had been too long in the camp to say anything more and merely let the days drag by. Sometimes he discovered that they were trying to escape. They laid their plans, carefully weighing the pros and cons, calculating what they thought was possible and making sure they knew where the worst dangers lay. Their attempts at escape were never successful, but that was not their fault. It was because their chances were too slender. David decided to follow their example. He would make a plan of action, weighing what he knew against what he did not, and carry it out without allowing himself to be depressed by thoughts or carried away by hope. On his side was the fact that, although he was very thin, he had strong, tough muscles. He had sharp eyes and ears, and he was used to doing with very little food. He stopped. Was there anything else to his credit? Yes, he was prepared for them. He knew their methods, the traps they set, their sudden crafty friendliness that meant they were hiding something, their pointed brutality. He was familiar with treachery, and he knew what death looked like. But what advantage was his knowledge of death when he was now determined to live? David frowned. Then he thought of another point in his favor. He could understand what people from different countries were talking about. Learning to do that had been a great help to him in the camp. When he could no longer pass the time thinking of mealtimes and the changing of the guard, there were various languages he could learn. David counted up how many he knew. First, of course, what they spoke. He could read that too. Then he knew French. That was what Johannes had spoken. And besides that, German and Italian and English. He knew some Spanish and quite a bit of Hebrew. Being able to talk to the sailor who had found him on board the ship had been a great advantage. And now he was in Italy. His knowledge of the language would be a blessing to him. David felt greatly encouraged. Perhaps he would recall other things he knew as he gradually grew accustomed to thinking again. However, there were plenty of things he knew nothing of. He knew there were maps, but he had never seen one, and he was quite ignorant of where the various countries of Europe lay or where their boundaries ran. He was not at all sure which of these countries were free. He thought there could not be many, and he had better reckon with the possibility that they were everywhere, even in free countries. Then there was the business of food. He would have to live on what he could find, and every time he would have to risk eating something poisonous in his ignorance or passing by what was edible and also going hungry. Worst of all, there were people. If he wanted to preserve his freedom, he would have to keep right away from them. But at the same time, he realized he would have to get to know something about how people lived outside a prison camp, since an unknown danger was more dangerous than one that could be reckoned with beforehand. And so David made another decision. When it was dark, he must go into the town that lay farther along the coast down by the sea. In the darkness, he could always slip into a gateway or around a street corner, as he had discovered in Salonica. But he would have to go while there were people about the street so that he could find out how they lived. Perhaps a boy among a crowd of people would appear less suspicious than a boy quite alone in a town where everyone was asleep. In any case, he would not be as dangerous now as it might be later, for no one could yet know where to look for him. Perhaps they would not look for him at all. Here again, David ran into the blank wall of his own ignorance. He did not know who he was, did not even know from what country he had come. He had always lived in the camp, and even Johannes, who knew many things, had not been able to find out anything about him for the simple reason that no one knew anything. David wondered what he looked like. In the man's hut, there had been a mirror, but it was hung too high. David had thought at one time that perhaps he was Jewish. As a rule, the people they imprisoned were those who had wanted to decide for themselves what they should believe and be free to write books and articles about it. But that could not apply to him. Jews, on the other hand, were sometimes imprisoned just because they did not like Jews. And they keep using the word they as the people that had him in the jail. T-H-E-Y in, in italics, the they. They said they did, but it was not true. But Johannes had said it was he was sure that David was not Jewish. Obviously, one could not always find out why, 
find out why they had arrested people. And if someone had happened to find him somewhere and take him along to the camp when he was quite small, then it might be that he was not of sufficient consequence for them to make any particular effort to recapture him. But he could not be sure of that. And so it'd be safer to assume that it was important for them to find him again. David realized that he must have a story. He knew from his experiences in the camp that it might be a matter of life and death to have a good story and stick to it, however much one might be questioned. In the evening, when he had seen the kind of life people lived, he might perhaps be able to hit upon a story he could make use of if anyone questioned him. Not that he intended that anyone should speak to him if he could avoid it, but it was best to be prepared. No one did take notice of him. While he was on the road, a man had turned around to look at him, but David had told himself, you mustn't look as if you're afraid. You mustn't look afraid and had gone on his way quite calmly. And down here in the town, no one at all turned to look at him. It was a small town, not like Salonika. The streets were small and narrow and very hilly. There was talk everywhere, people walking along with baskets and parcels, people standing in shops where the lights were lit, all were talking. The first time David was aware of it, he could hardly bring himself to move on. Almost everyone was laughing. It was not the ugly laughter he was used to when they laughed at the prisoners. It sounded pleasant, very beautiful, as if they were all content with life and felt friendly towards one another. David knew, of course, that his impression could not be right, but perhaps there were not so many of them here in Italy, or perhaps there just were not any in this town. And the people were beautiful. David had seen good-looking people before. They were often good-looking when they first arrived in the camp, but only Johannes had preserved a beauty of expression right up to the time of his death. And the few women David had seen looked quite different from those here. They had been hard of face, as they always were. And, and yes, if there were scarcely any difference between them and the men. But here they were beautiful, their hair long, black, and waving, many of them with smooth, sun-tanned faces, and all dressed in beautiful clothes of many colors, like the sea and the trees and the golden fruit. David saw the same fruit again, a whole pile of it in a great basket outside of a shop. Arancia, it was called. David suddenly recalled a ger German word, word Apfelsinen. He had heard of it after all, if only the letters were not so difficult to read. Johannes had taught him the shapes of the letters they used in other countries, but that was so long ago. If only he had a book so that he could practice reading those letters. Going down into the town had been a good move. No one took any notice of him, and he could learn a lot by looking in the shops. He could find out what food looked like, and many other things, too, that he had never seen before and did not know the use of. They had an enormous number of possessions, these people. David felt quite dizzy with looking at so many things, and he stopped a moment. In front of him, a man and a woman were walking along, and as they talked and laughed together, they were eating something they had brought from a shop. When they finished, the woman threw away the newspaper that had been wrapped around what they had been eating. His heart beating faster, David picked it up in the dark. There was often something printed on the paper things were wrapped in. He hurried on to the nearest light. Yes, there was printing on it, something he could practice reading. Tomorrow, when it grew light, he dared not stand still too long outside a brightly lit shop. Besides, he did not feel too well. He had a headache and felt sick. He had better go back to his rock now. He looked up and discovered he was standing in a large square. At first he was frightened, for he felt much safer in the narrow streets, but then he forgot his fear as he saw in front of him on the other side of the square a very big building with what he took to be a searchlight on top. A prison camp? For a moment David's heart stopped beating, so panic-stricken was he. Then he noticed a large bell hanging in the tower. A church. If there's a bell, then it's a church, he remembered Johannes had once told him. But he did not tell him that a church could be so beautiful. Its walls built of different kinds of stone that formed intricate and lovely patterns. Its great doors approached by a magnificent flight of steps. David looked at the church for a long time. He felt it had some meaning for him, but he could not tell what. He had felt, his head felt very heavy as if he'd been running all night long. He must return to the hideout. Slowly he turned his back upon the square and went down into the narrow, brightly lit streets again. He stopped outside a shop where they baked round flat loaves with what he had learned were called tomatoes on top. He was hungry. Not very hungry at the moment, but he would be by the morning. He had once seen a guard shoot a prisoner for trying to steal his food. Perhaps in the morning he would find another orange. He turned to go. Hi. Want one, eh? David turned around with a start. The man was standing in the open doorway, offering him one of the loaves. David automatically put out his hand, and then he quickly withdrew it. A trap. He would take the bread, and then the man would fetch them. He looked up into the man's face and saw it was just like the sailors, the same slightly stupid expression, the same good-natured eyes. David hesitated. Perhaps he would not have him arrested. There were some good people, Joannes had told him, and he had heard the same thing from other prisoners. They had often spoke of those who had helped them and hidden them for long periods when they were after them. The man laughed in a hearty, friendly way, the way everybody laughed here. Well, perhaps the young fellow isn't hungry, he said. Yes, yes, I am, David answered. Thank you very much. He took the bread and off he went with quick, unhurried steps. The man frowned and looked at him, a little puzzled. Then he shrugged his shoulders right up to his ears and let them fall again as if he were shaking something off and went back to his loaves. 
Never in the whole of David's life had a day passed so quickly as did the next one. Still free, he had gotten back to his rocks again, eaten half the bread the man had given him and lain down to sleep. When he awoke, it was day and everything was just as warm and beautiful in the bright sunshine as it had been on the previous day. He had run up to the little stream to wash before anyone was about. And even the fact that his soap had grown much thinner from overuse over much use the day before did not really trouble him. Perhaps it was because he had washed his shirt and trousers with it as well. He decided to make do with washing his hands and feet and face that day and go sparingly with his precious soap. Then he ran downhill again, nearly forgetting in his eagerness to get back to his piece of paper to look carefully up and down the road before he crossed it. That must not happen again. He made himself count to a hundred before he picked up his paper in order to remind himself how important it was to never do anything without thinking. The scrap of newspaper was difficult to read. The evening before, he had read several notices in the town, but this was in proper sentences with many words together. David murmured the names of the letters to himself, first one by one, and then running them together three or four at a time. And after a bit, the sounds began to take shape as words he already knew. Then he began reading to himself what was on the paper. On the whole, it proved disappointing. Some of it was about things you could buy, but none of it was any use to a boy escaping from a prison. There was something about motor cars, and the last bit was about a king. But at that point, the paper was torn across, and David could not even find out where the king came from. From what he had heard in the camp, David had gathered that the countries that had kings were free, and their people had no need to be frightened of them. But there were not many countries like that, and the knowledge was not much use to him since he did not know where those countries were. However, his belief that he might perhaps avoid capture seemed to have grown stronger since the day before. He had seen so much in the town that he knew deep within himself he would have to go th down there again, but he would not yet admit it to himself. He pulled both ways. He was pulled both ways. He had a passionate desire to go back and learn more about what things were like outside the camp, and at the same time, he was afraid that he might forget to hide his fears. As long as it was still daylight, he would think no more about paying another visit to town. He had plenty of other things to occupy himself, all that he had seen the previous day and all that he wanted to know and would have to find out for himself. And there was his piece of paper. Even if it contained nothing of any use to him, he could always read the letters comparing the words as they appeared in print with the way they sounded when they were spoken until he was sure he could read properly. And in between times, when his head began to buzz with the weight of too many problems that seemed to have no solution, there were the beautiful surroundings that he would never tire of looking at. The blue sea stretching farther than I could reach and the land with its ever-changing coastline. The green hills, the bare red rocks, the brightly colored houses gleaming like fruit here and there in the sun. When evening came, David went down to the town again and again the next morning and the next and each time he learned something new. Enough to occupy his thoughts all day long in this rocky hiding place. And although he knew there must be many things he had no idea of, this was not brought home to him until the third evening when he saw a little baby. And I'm going to stop there with chapter two, and I will keep reading chapter two on the next video.